Willie D. Live. Hey. Man, I, I thought about changing my name and going with an initial first. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. Like, I think that's kind of cool when people do it. It adds a little mystery. Okay. Everybody want to know what the P stands exactly, for. What the P true. stand for. Yeah. All that type of stuff. I ain't going to even ask you because that's why you put a P instead of putting your name. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so, but I will tell you, though, people don't know. They usually be like, is it Percy? Is it Pimpin? Is it Blair? Is it, you know, <laughs> Purnell? Yeah. But uh, P Frank actually stands for Positive Frank. Yeah. Yeah. In real life. In real life, it, do you mean that's your name for? Well, is I got your that real nickname, name. Well, okay, nickname, government right. name. But in terms of somebody as a uh, growing up in Oakland, I was a junior high backstory. There was a girl who used to be complaining, just you know, kind of it's like kind of a Willie D story. She'd be complaining every day, Asian girl. Oh my God, and whatever. And I was like, No, it's gonna be all good. Yes, don't worry. It's class, whatever. And then she's like, Oh, you're always so positive, Mister Positive, whatever. And so every day, so there's Positive Frank, and then people are like, Oh, Positive Frank, what up? And then it. You know, I can't be in the entertainment industry saying positive Frank, and it was already positive K, yeah. so I shortened it to <laughs> That's P Frank. Dope. That's yeah, but dope. it is it is come from positive Frank, yes. That's dope. Yes, yes, yes. Man, yes. you got a dope story, man. Like your life is really interesting. A lot of people who we talk about on a daily basis, their careers have been touched by you in some way. Mm -hmm. Like you are that dude. <laughs> like, so, and, and this all started with I heard a love letter. You used to write love letters for the homies in the hood. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so, yeah, growing up in Oakland, I grew up in an area called Funk Town. Um, and I grew up in the shadow of the Black Panther Party in real life. I saw Bobby and Huey and, you know, and the Hells Angels. And then I was seeing Felix Mitchell. And, and, you know, I grew up in a weird place where very conscious, but very street and very dangerous. You know, you from Fifth Ward. And so as a kid, I was in the hood. I was like the gangster's little brother. You know, I was like the kid, like, the you know, in the hood, yeah. the people shooting, beating up. They're like the little kid with the glasses and the books. So a lot of my homies, you know. They were street affiliated or whatever, and they're dealing drugs. And, you know, they like Lakeisha or Boom Keisha or whoever or mm -hmm. Tasha. But they don't really know how to, you know, write her a letter. Like, hey, man, that's the little the kid, the one that'll be writing it with a little notebook all the time and writing little poems and stuff. Um, and I was like, yo, man, I can write a letter for you. 20 bucks, 15 bucks. Tell me what she looked like. You know what I mean? I, was, I guess I was being a reporter at the time. I didn't know it. But, yes, in the early 80s, I got my start, I guess, as a journalist. I didn't know it. By writing love letters for my homies. And I would charge them, though. I wasn't yeah. doing it for free. So uh, you, you give me a little description of what she looked like, her body, how you feel about her. I'd write up, you know, oh, girl, Tasha, you know, my name's Willie, and I was thinking about you in eighth grade class, and then, you know, you walk with the yellow dress on, and the way you <laughs> smell was amazing. And then the brother's like, yeah, make write some more of that shit, write some more of that shit. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, what you charging? <laughs> I started 10 at first. Ten dollars. Yes, this is in the eighties. I was making bread. Let me tell you. Were you, in, were you at? Is, is this at Roosevelt Middle School? Yes. Yeah. And, and ten bucks. You getting ten dollars? And in sometimes middle school I, uh, for no, but I'll be doing like five or six letters a week. What? So I was making money. I was hustling. Me, I was like, I had no money, so I'm like, I gotta find a way to make some bread, just like you. So yes. And then I started to write in twenty. By the time the crack situation, because they had, I'm watching them big a wad of money. I'm like, you can give me that yeah. twenty. So yes, that's how I started in the game. Man, yeah. uh, now are you still a writer? Do you write poetry to your woman? Um, I did recently. I do write sometimes, but I, you know, I obviously we know each other because of me being a writer at the Source and LA Times. But um, I write the shows that you see. So if you watch American Gangster or Unsung, I've taken my writing that you would see in a magazine or a newspaper, and I write the show. The, from the, you know, Houston's most infamous neighborhood, it's the Ghetto Boys. Right. Well, you know, so I do that, but not in the same way I used to. And by the way, man, salute, salute, salute on what you did for us on Unsung. Okay. That was Thank an you. amazing episode. I've seen a lot of people try to chronicle Ghetto Boy's story, but you did it in a way that is capsulated in history. Right. Like, that was dope. Thank you. When it started out. Yeah. I like the way you threw that little bell in there from when I used to box. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. You know, yeah. That was dope. And you guys are obviously one of my favorite uh, things that I've ever been involved with, just story-wise. And, you know, we know each other from all the way in the 90s. You know, that's people don't realize that, you know, when you guys were going through back and forth, I would chronicle that, and when you got back together, and then it made sense because we already had a history to do, you know, almost 15 years later to do the unsung. And so it's good to see you guys. And, you know, I think, like I tell Bone Thugs or people I've known for years, just to see you guys healthy and alive, obviously Bill died, is a victory, you know, because of where we've come from, the cancer, the drugs. Think about all the people that started when we started in the late 80s, early 90s that aren't here, yeah. whether it be health or an unfortunate situation, death, 
murder. So it's good. You're healthy. My girl was like, damn, Willie look good. I'm like, yeah, he ain't like, bloated. He ain't lost all his teeth. He don't look good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Think about how people are our age are, you know, looking yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that is a blessing, man. And it's, you know, it's, when I think about it, it it's kind of scary when I think about it. You know, it kind of mm-hmm. spooked me a little because I'm so much more appreciative of people like you mm-hmm. when I look at you. Mm-hmm. Because I know I can't take it for granted that you'll be here tomorrow. Correct. You know, hopefully you live to be as long as you want to live. Mm-hmm. But it when I see the people that put the work in, especially, and uh, but he, he, even even just loved ones, you know, like mm-hmm. some of my uh, good family members, like really close family members, are in the twilight of their life, mm-hmm. and you know. Every moment you look at them, like even, you try not to be cynical, right? Right. But it's hard to not n- know that the end is coming. Well, I mean, we are. You know, in, in, in think a, of that. We're you know? in the third act of our life, by the way. If you look at your yeah. life in quarters, I guess, you know, or even twenty-five, twenty-five. If you get to seventy-five or thirty, 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 more of your life is behind you than it is in front of you. So right. I'm always really worried about what am I going to do with the time left. Even with the jobs that I take or things that I do or situations or whatever, I'm really cautious, especially because there's been so much, you know, on Pac and Big and Guru and different people that I've known and, you know, Easy e or even my boy Slim 400 who just got murdered in uh, Inglewood like a couple years ago. I think about the moments that I have with it and I'm like, I, I, I want to cherish them. So I'm like, let me create more moments um, in the culture and just, you know, it's important to do that and be thoughtful and thankful. Yeah, and so you produced Hip Hop Homicides uh-huh. Right? Was it homicide? Yeah, Hip hop yeah. homicides. You did um, Who Shot Pac and Biggie and, mm-hmm. and a number of other stories along those lines, like crime type sto- mm-hmm. theme stories. <laughs> why do you produce those type of uh, those type of stories? And why why are you so passionate about bringing those type of stories to life? Well, you know, I always thought um, when I was starting out in hip hop. Uh, I remember a lot of them didn't take us very seriously, right? And so I would read Rolling Stone. I started reading The Source or whatever. And I was like, oh, The Source, they're actually talking about, these are people who are going from inside the culture to outside. I'm not an outsider of it because I come from it. And they know how to tell our story. So even as a kid in high school, we needed people of color to tell our stories. It's not fair. I remember when I was working on um, uh, Who Killed Tupac? on A&E with Ben Crump. There's a six-part series that I did with Ben Crump that I produced and I also was in. There was a white guy who, um, we were doing like the little fact sheet about Tupac. And so he, I told him, well, you know, when Tupac was a kid, Afeni made him read the Wall Street Journal back and forth in the New York Times and explain different stories to her and whatever. And then the guy said, that could never have happened. Tupac would have never have read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And I was like, oh, that's what you think, and you're in control of the media. And so without me being there, it's important. So for me, it's important that people like me tell our stories. You know, as working as a reporter at the LA Times, I can't tell you how many stereotypical headlines or things that they were going to do or say. You know, when Tupac died, I remember there was a reporter that I was friends with, and he was like, that's good. That motherfucker, he deserved to die, criminal and gangster. Yeah, he he just— he thinks that way about all black men. He, he wanted to say that anyway, you know. So right, every, so I'm every saying, chance he gets, correct. You right. know, I'm sure he said the same thing about Michael Brown and right. Tavon, uh, yeah. Trayvon Martin. And but I, but I'm saying to your to your question, to Mir Rice, I have to tell these stories, and it needs people like me to tell those stories. You know, when I was at the Grammys, this was whatever, maybe like a year or two before Meth and um, Mary won for all. It's going to be like '93, right after Will Smith. So I'm around there. And I was in the, in the, so in the Grammy room backstage, which, you know, there's like a press area. And so they never didn't want to have hip hop on TV. People don't remember. There was a time when they wouldn't let hip hop artists. Right. You know, it's not that long ago. And uh, I remember being in the room and they wouldn't even let black reporters or black journalists in the place. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking how far we've come now that hip hop is the most dominant thing in the world. So I'm saying it's important that people like me tell stories about people like us yeah. because they get it, you know, totally different. Some of us are in a position now where we are the gatekeepers. We were on the outside looking in. Mm-hmm. And some of us have elevated to ownership and upper management, so mm-hmm. to speak. And I've noticed that 
some of us have gotten in those positions and, and instead of continuing to fight for the culture and fighting to try to lift everybody up and bring everybody up with them, they decided, you know what, I'm going to be a gatekeeper and I'm going to make sure that only me and my buddy is cool. Right. I've seen that happen, mm -hmm. uh, especially in hip hop. How often have you seen something like that happen in film and television? All the time. I mean, I think um, I have a friend and I always tease him um, because we go out, we meet people. And he doesn't really want to give me access to his white people. He keeps his certain white people to himself so he can be mm -hmm. the black guy for that white people. Right. And me, I'm like, I want to get everybody an opportunity. You know, I'm, I'm from the Black Panther thing. I'm opening up the back window in the bathroom so you can sneak in and let's all get in and get a check. You know, I have a new company for the culture, by the culture. And the point of that is that the culture makes things about the culture so mm -hmm. that people of color have a chance to tell their own stories. And so even though I'm in these rooms and a lot of times... I do these shows and I'm the black person with an all white crew. And so now I want to make sure that people of color get opportunities behind and in front of the camera because a lot of times, you know, I'm doing something now and I was on the phone with the people and I won't say the network, but there's not one person of color tell me they were doing a show. It's about hip hop and crime. But the, the questions that they had were just, well, why do these rappers kill each other? They are making a lot of money now. Shouldn't they stop doing that? Like, the, this is what they are saying, and they're about to produce a whole thing about us. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's important that I dare and say something and try to weave that story? It's always good to have some of us in the room. But when you start to sell out, you know, as you you know, you know, guys always talk about selling out, I don't do that. You know, I keep the message thorough from the culture. And I think, um, I got to say, a lot of white mainstream people respect that because I speak their language and I have all the degrees and the paperwork, but then I'm telling you, you know, that ain't cool. So you got to have a few of us in the room, you know, because there's a bunch of Negroes up in there. They're doing a little shuffle real quick to get that check.